Hi, my name is Ben Cook, and I'm the founder of Red Pill Strategies, a boutique strategy shop focused on helping organizations navigate the many high-stakes challenges they face operating in a 24-7 digital jungle. While many businesses think of social media as a channel for reach, a place to take their existing strategy and connect with new audiences, we flip that formula on its head and develop approaches native to the social media age, informed by data-backed recommendations that help negotiators better understand their digital threats and emerging opportunities. What do I mean by that? Well, in this video, I'll be walking you through a case study using Amazon's failed bid for a second headquarters in New York City, so-called HQ2. If you're not familiar, this proposed project would have provided 50,000 high-paying jobs, a juicy development prize. In late 2018, Amazon took what negotiators call a decide, announce, defend approach to selecting New York as the lucky winner of this contest. They felt they were in a strong position. When it was announced, the deal had an overwhelming 85% local support. Both the governor and the mayor were vocal advocates, with the governor even joking he would change his name to Amazon Cuomo if they would pick New York. But it didn't take long for that 15% of local opponents to emerge as a real problem. Small-scale protests cropped up around the city, but online, these voices became especially dominant. As pressure mounted, an opponent of the project, State Senator Michael Giannaris, was nominated to a key board with oversight over the deal terms. At that point, after repeated public humiliations, the company withdrew their offer and New York lost out on those 50,000 high-paying jobs. So the question is, how did an unfunded ad hoc group of amateur online activists defeat one of the world's most valuable tech-savvy companies over a multi-billion dollar deal with 85% local support? Well, to begin getting our heads around this David versus Goliath defeat, we're gonna borrow a tool from the field of social media intelligence and use it to visualize the universe of conversation around Amazon's HQ2 deal in Long Island City. So what you're looking at here is a network graph depicting Twitter conversation around a pivotal city council hearing. The dots represent individual Twitter users, the lines are conversations between them, and the distance is a measure of importance or influence within the network. So if we dive in here, the first observation we have is how utterly peripheral Amazon is to this conversation. You can see them here in the red circle. If you note their position on the graph, you'll see that Amazon was almost completely absent on Twitter and had essentially no ability to influence this debate or frame perceptions. It's remarkable, and ultimately this oversight meant they had no leverage to shape the outcome of their deal online. If Amazon wasn't driving this conversation, who was? Who was shaping the way New Yorkers perceived this deal? Well, as you can see here, the conversation was overwhelmingly dominated by anti-Amazon activists, and specifically supporters of Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Their activity has made her among the most mentioned accounts in the network, even though she actually hasn't posted it herself. Now, AOC had just won a shock upset victory over a well-established incumbent Democratic politician in a nearby district. The coalition of hyper-online local progressives that propelled her to victory was knowledgeable about the area, extremely digitally savvy, and just waiting to be activated to oppose a deal like this. And here you can see various leaders in her camp doing exactly that. For example, this account is Zephyr Teachout, a Fordham law professor popular among the Bernie Sanders crowd. Democratic socialist aligned influencers like her are the ones who are engaging every day, sharing the posts that go viral and reach the most people, and playing a pivotal role in shaping how the conversation evolved. And this is where it gets really interesting, because in this graph you see a group of democratic socialist accounts literally surrounding one user, State Senator Michael Giannaris. He's the one I mentioned earlier, whose opposition uh, to the deal and nomination to a key oversight board ultimately derailed the project. Now, what's curious about Senator Giannaris 
is that he was a lifelong moderate. He was a middle-of-the-road, largely pro-development individual who, when he saw the hyper-online AOC movement topple another moderate Democrat in a neighboring district, swiftly moved to the left and began embracing these largely symbolic, high-profile progressive stands designed to go viral. It got to the point where this lifelong moderate began calling himself the Amazon Slayer online and in the media. And when you look at this network, it's no surprise why. When it came to lobbying Michael Giannaris online, this coalition of anti-development, democratic socialist users completely drowned out all other voices. So this obviously create, created quite a problem for Amazon and its 85% of local supporters. But before we get into that, I have one final observation to make about this network. Conversation here is being driven and defined by these small-scale, highly active users who often have very few followers, but are engaged in this peer-to-peer -peer conversation where they are talking to individual users in different groups across different constituencies, forming the bridges that tie this network together. In essence, what you're seeing here is the real-time formation of a digital coalition. These users are the ones responsible for the overwhelming anti-Amazon sentiment online. But who are they? Well, they are almost exclusively immigration rights activists, which is somewhat bizarre. On the face of it, this deal had nothing to do with immigration rights. Instead, these users had a separate bone to pick with Amazon over its web services division's contract with Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and they believed the company was insufficiently responsive to their demands. And so even though they had no interest in the specifics of the HQ2 deal, this was an opportunity for them to exert outsized leverage over the company. And what this shows is that any public negotiation like this presents a unique vulnerability to activist pressure that might be completely unrelated to the specifics of the deal at hand. It's these users and their online behaviors that led to the defeat of a coalition including 85% of local support, the governor, and the mayor, all at the hands of small-scale group of users who successfully targeted key digital pressure points like Senator Michael Giannaris. What's significant about this case is not that Amazon was bad at negotiating. It's that Amazon was completely blind to the realities of the situation on the ground. In this editorial cartoon, Jeff Bezos can't see that there's a worm hidden in the Big Apple of New York City. And in fact, after Amazon announced it would withdraw from the deal, a huge group of union organizers, local elected officials, and community leaders wrote an open letter in the New York Times beseeching Jeff Bezos to reconsider. Had Amazon employed tools and approaches like the ones we've been exploring here, they might not have been so blind to the support on the ground. But with a traditional toolkit and a decide-announce-defend approach, Amazon completely failed to mobilize this coalition in a meaningful way. So regardless of how you feel about the merits and specifics of this project as proposed, there was a deal to be made here, and Amazon's blindness resulted in everyone losing out on that opportunity. So the overall lesson we take away here is that, like it or not, this is the world we live in, and you have to be prepared for this new breed of tactics. The key question is, how?